My second child, Towns, uh, is obsessed with two things. Uh, the video game Fortnite, everyone know Fortnite? And NASCAR. And I, I kind of appreciate Fortnite, like I get Fortnite, but I have no idea about NASCAR. I, don't, I have no idea where that came from. And about a month and a half ago, um, Towns comes up to me and he says, Dad, you know what's happening on, on, uh, on February 17th? Towns, I have no idea what's happening on February 17th. He said, it's the Daytona 500. The Daytona 500. And he's so excited, you know. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a pretty cool thing, right? I'm not into NASCAR, but Daytona 500, everyone knows that. Fast forward to now, 40 days, every single day since then, every morning, Dad, 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 you know it's February 17th. You know it's February. So by the time it gets to now, I'm sitting here going, Daytona 500, yeah, Daytona 500, Daytona 500. Every time I say Daytona 500, his face lights up. He's the most excited he could be about it. And I, the reason I tell that story is because, and that's true, that is the dead honest truth. Um, the way we deal with the urgency of climate change is almost like the way I deal with towns about the Daytona 500. When we hear it repeatedly over and over, the urgent need to act, the urgent need to act, the urgent need to act, we can often just, it becomes a drip, drip, drip in the background. One of the reasons why we do this, one of the reasons why we have everyone here today is to overcome that drip. What we're trying to do is to encourage us and catalyze this action while we're here together. So what we want to do is first be clear about the urgency of the problem. We need to decarbonize the global economy by 2050. And we need to do that in a way that protects the most vulnerable populations in society. And, and if that isn't a challenge, if that's not an urgent challenge, if you don't feel that, then it's hard to imagine that you're kind of alive today. But it, we can often forget that fact. And what do the urgent solutions look like to that urgent challenge? Well, first of all, we kind of need a conceptual path forward. How do we decarbonize the global economy? Well, and you might have seen this exercise before, you first start with how much carbon is there right now that we emit as a society? And if this page would represent the 40 gigatons of carbon that we emit every year, to get there, to get to a, a, a decarbonized economy by 2050, we have to eliminate this page, we gotta get rid of it. And so what um, some re researchers call the carbon law, which is we need to reduce carbon emissions in half every decade between now and 2050. So we go from 40 gigatons to 20 gigatons, 2020 to 2030. Then we go from 20 gigatons to 10, 2030 to 2040. And then we go from 10 gigatons to five, and we're at 2050. So we have five gigatons left, and by 2050, with negative emission technology, we can get to a decarbonized economy. So conceptually, it's possible. At last year's summit, we actually heard from Paul Hawken about Project Drawdown's assessments of the top 100 solutions to address global warming, and these are all currently viable solutions. Categories like materials, electricity generation, land use, and food systems. And maybe surprisingly to some gender equity, educating girls and family planning are, the, are two of the top 10 solutions. So these solutions exist. We know what we need to do and we know how to do those solutions. It's time to really stop talking about them as if they're great unknowns. You know, Drawdown lays out 100 ways to do it. And some of these are actually being rapidly deployed. The proportion of renewables in our global energy supply has doubled roughly every five years since the year 2000. So scaling solutions is not only possible, it's happening, and we need to maintain our sense of solution urgency, not just climate urgency, but solution urgency to push this forward. <clears throat> so in both, case, both cases, the, the decline in emissions and the growth in solutions, we're talking about the power of exponential change. This is not linear change, this is exponential change. And with the ratchet effect, we crank up our ambition and create new standards as we go. It's kind of like when you're uh, at the beginning of that first hill of a roller coaster, you know, and you tick, 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 
Every time you tick up, you, you know you're not going back, and pretty soon you go over that hill, right? So that's what we need to do with our ambition, and higher education can play a key role in establishing and acting upon this sense of climate urgency through both being an actor and an enabler of the change that we want to see. So this is what second nature we refer to as in and through higher education. So as an actor, if we're to be taken seriously, then we need to make sure our own house is in order. Our campuses need to be reducing emissions in line with what is globally necessary. We have to have ambitious enough plans to get us here. And you know, this carbon law isn't based on committing to reduce something, it's based on actually doing it. And that means we may need to plan on ratchet, ratcheting up our own action plans, elevating our own building performance standards, rethinking our own infrastructure decisions, producing and advocating for things like 100% clean energy. And as an enabler, it's not about getting our own house in order, it's about using our academic and institutional resources to help get the global house in order. And to, you know, to be fair, we need humility here. Uh, higher ed isn't the savior, but we can bring our sector's complementary strengths into initiatives that are happening at the local, state, national, and international levels. Research, teaching, service, community engagement, political influence, civil discourse, idea exchange, all these go well beyond just an operational footprint. And the theme of this conference is local action, global impact. You all are local. And what it means to turn that local presence, sometimes kind of latent resources that sit there isolated and disconnected, it means that you weave it into other sectors to change society. We're not acting in isolation. So there's evidence that we can do this. Over the next two days, you'll actually hear plenty of examples where institutions are acting both as an actor and as an enabler. Campuses in the Climate Leadership Network report progress to us on your goals. So we have hundreds of reports that are submitted each year. Carbon neutrality targets continue to be met and we're ratcheting up ambition using these data. We recognize the progress and it really informs how we serve campuses based on what the needs are. And we support the Climate Leadership Network in, another way, in many other ways. We provide direct access to tools and resources to accelerate campuses' role both as an actor and as an enabler. And I just want to take a second to highlight the staff. Is there any Second Nature staff in the room? Could you stand? They're all working outside. <laughs> well, give them a, yeah. This is network management. I, these are the staff members that support the work of the institutions, and there's not that many of us. But it is, it is through their effort, it is through their effort that this network activity happens. We've helped develop aggregated renewable energy clusters around the country, advocated on your behalf, for favorable climate and energy policies, help create a carbon pricing toolkit to provide a guide for setting up innovative programs on campus, and expanded climate resilience activity with workshops with an explicit and inex inextricable connection to local communities. We continue to represent the network and connect schools to cross-sector opportunities like America's Pledge we are still in in the University Climate Change Coalition. With key strategic corporate partners like Customer First Renewables, Siemens, NG, Open Road Renewables, and McKinstry were responsively, re responsively providing technical support for your work based on your climate leadership commitments and the climate priorities that you tell us are needed to get there. So this time together is meant to inspire, challenge, stimulate, shape our future work together. Shake us up a little bit so that our urgency to act isn't lost. That's the easiest thing that could happen. We cannot turn that into background noise. We can together drive the needed change. We can together accelerate climate action in and through higher education. Uh, and I, I kind of want to do this just because I can tell my son we did this. The one famous thing that NASCAR drivers, the beginning of the race, what is the thing that everyone, anyone know? It's driver start your engines, right? So we can. On the count of three, let's do the driver start your engines. One, two, three. Drivers start your engines. Okay, great. I can, I can honestly say that to him. Okay, thanks so much for coming, and I very much look forward to the, the w couple days ahead. So obviously one of our key partners is the Intentional Endowments Network, and George Dyer is the principal there, and um, look forward to hearing your remarks, George. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody.
Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us for this year's summit. Um, as Tim mentioned, my name is George Dyer, and along with Tony Cortese, um, founded the Intentional Endowments Network about four and a half years ago uh, after working with Tony at Second Nature on the President's Climate Commitment for several years. Um, I'm just gonna briefly share a little bit about IEN uh, and then a little bit about the design of this meeting and what we're up for for the next couple of days before introducing our first speaker. Uh, but first, I mentioned Tony Cortese. I know many of you know Tony. Uh, for those of you who don't, Tony has been at the forefront of uh, either founding or establishing or having his fingerprints all over most of the um, major organizations, initiatives, programs around climate and sustainability in higher education. Um, this fall, ASHE honored Tony with their first ever Lifetime Achievement Award. It's the highest honor they bestow. It was a very well-deserved uh, recognition. I know well appreciated by Tony. Uh, Tony remains a great leader of our organization, of this movement overall. Um, and I just wanted to ask you in, uh, to join me in thanking, congratulating, and, and recognizing Tony on this honor. <laughs> Stand up, Tony. Take a bow. <laughs> And I also wanted to ask the rest of the team uh, and at the Crane Institute and our board members from the Crane Institute who are here to also please stand up, along with the uh, steering committee members from the Intentional Endowments Network who are here, just so people can see who you are. Um, these are the folks who are really, in many ways, the core of the network, helping to make it happen, and uh, great resources if you have questions, want to learn any more about this network. So thank you all for being here and for your work as well. So IEN is a peer learning network. We now have 153 members, including 55 endowments, the balance being investment managers, investment consultants, nonprofit partners working in this ecosystem to advance mission aligned and sustainable investing. Uh, for those of you who are not yet members, we invite you to join. As a peer learning network, there are no commitments or reporting requirements. It's really about learning and collaborating to make uh, mission aligned and impact investing uh, easier and the norm at endowments and, and supporting endowments and charting their own path on this journey. It's a way for endowments to put a stake in the ground and say we are a part of this conversation. Even if your institution hasn't taken any steps in this area or doesn't have immediate plans to do so, it helps to show that you're taking these uh, ideas seriously, that you're engaged with your peers and not ignoring them. You'll get great access to resources and uh, really committed experts and peers who have been working in this space and, and wrestling with these sometimes tricky issues. Uh, we understand how complicated and sensitive the endowment question can be. Uh, so the network is designed to be a safe space where endowment leaders and stakeholders can learn from each other and take feasible steps. And even small steps can have a big impact in this space. Just by calling for more sustainable investment options, endowments can send a powerful signal to the market. And that can help shift the whole financial system and in turn have real immediate impacts on the eco economic system. And we continue to see changes in corporate behavior around climate and sustainability in response from demand from investors. It's also a great way to engage your trustees in these conversations uh, and to do so around topics that are really central to their roles as fiduciaries. Issues around preserving and growing that all important endowment capital and ensuring that the mission is front and center in everything that the institution does. Uh, in case you missed it, the folks at Second Nature sent out a special offer to all of you uh, who are part of Second Nature's network earlier this month um, that any endowment that's not yet an IEN member and participates in the summit uh, can join for free for their first year. So we really do hope that you'll be in touch, take us up on that offer, um, and, and join the network after the summit. The more endowments that we have in the network, the more powerful that signal becomes, uh, and, and the more... Uh, influence it can have over the finance industry and the economy as a whole. We've already seen an amazing acceleration in the past few years in terms of the amount um, and quality of the investment products and solutions offered. So it really can be a simple way to contribute uh, to high leverage systemic impact. Now just a few important uh, pieces about the design of our meeting today and what we're going to get into over the next couple of days. First, a big, big thank you to our sponsors. None of this would have been possible without them. In particular, I'd like to recognize our gold level sponsors, Customer First Renewable and Greenbacker Capital, uh, for stepping up at this highest level to support this event and these networks, and also for the really amazing high impact work they're doing around large scale renewable energy. I'd also like to name our silver sponsors, Enbaric, Glenmead, Greystone Consulting of Morgan Stanley, and Natixis Investment Management. 
We really appreciate their work and support and, uh, and all of our sponsors uh, who are recognized throughout our uh, summit materials. So please join us in connecting with them and thanking them as well. So as you may remember when you registered, we asked you all three questions. We asked you what your burning questions were on, this topic, on these topics, what you might bring to these conversations, and what you wanted to get out of them. What would make a successful summit for you? We got lots of great responses, thank you. Um, and you had many questions across kind of the institutional focuses that you all represent. There are questions on endowment investing, on working with local communities and government, on funding the technical solutions on campus, on education and research, on measuring impact, and on working across campus silos uh, to enact more action. There's lots of comments and questions about how to do this in the context of the current administration's efforts to roll back climate action on the federal level. And when our country seems to be going backwards at a time when we need to be moving forward faster than ever on climate action, there are lots of questions about what can we do? How can we build on our climate action to date? And how can we ensure that we're always moving from talk to action? Given the urgency that Tim laid out, and we'll hear more from our speakers in a minute, um, these are the types of things that were on top of your minds. So we've shared your questions with our speakers. We've designed our sessions to address them. And you also had many questions about what others are doing, what's worked and what hasn't on campuses. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience from all of you in this room, we know that. And so many of the answers to those questions will come through the small table dialogue conversations that we'll have. And uh, we've really designed the program to create a lot of space for those between and after all of our speakers. Finally, there's tremendous consistency about what you wanted to come away with from the summit. You wanted to come away with concrete, impactful ideas that you can take home and put into action. You wanted to come away with inspiring connections and potential partners for this work. And you wanted to come away with leadership that moves us from talk to action. So following our first speaker, we'll get right into our first conversation around those topics. 